Hey, hi, hello, me again. I would have been back much sooner, but my last attempt at a video got blocked by Netflix and nothing that I did would work. So that video is lost forever. Unless you're a member of my Patreon where I will be finding a way to dump the file at some point. Maybe one day I will have the energy to really fight something like that, but today is not that day. So until then, if you want to see a fun little video about romance movies where I had to take almost everything out of it except my face, then keep an eye on my Patreon because it may wind up being an exclusive. On to today's topic, it is spooky season. And boy, do I love horror movies. Every year I watch a bunch of them around this time. I mean, I watch them the rest of the year too, but something about the viewing experience is just different when everywhere you look, there's like skeletons and spider webs and graves and stuff. A problem that I face around this time of year is that I want a specific type of movie. Not a slasher film, not blood and gore, something else. I've never really been able to put into words exactly the genre that I need to like rev my engine around this time of year. So I am going to try and do that through example today. One of my all time favorite horror movies is a Spanish film called The Orphanage. You know you're in for something good when you see that presented by Guillermo del Toro on screen. This movie came out in 2007, but I didn't watch it until a few years later. It is about pretty much the scariest thing that me in my early 20s could have possibly imagined. Children. More specifically, this child. Okay, technically it's about this one, but sackcloth head over there is the one that you're going to remember. This is Laura. This is Laura when she was an orphan living at the old orphanage. Laura was adopted and now as an adult, she has bought the place with her husband to open it up as a home for terminally ill kids. She has her own adopted son, Simon, who is HIV positive and has to take regular medication to keep it in check. Laura tells him that this medication is his vitamins. During the open house, Simon goes missing. Laura and her husband spend ages trying to find him with no real luck. Laura suspects that something in the house can tell them what happened to Simone, but her husband is less than supportive. He leaves to give her a few days alone in the house to sort herself out. There's a series of paranormal incidents where Laura discovers a tragedy that happened here after she was adopted as a child, and, well, she does find Simone eventually. That's as spoiler-free as I can really make it, because this movie is worth every second of watch time, and I don't want to spoil any of it for you. They confirm early on that these paranormal things are actually happening because we see the kid in the mask physically interact with the environment around him. So the movie doesn't waste any time trying to convince us that Laura is imagining things. Our frustration comes from everyone around her not believing that she saw what she saw, and we just want her to get on with investigating the house and ignore all of them. Horror movies about motherhood are hit or miss for me because they often seem clumsy or preachy. This one works for me largely because Laura is a three-dimensional character. Go figure, you can make a really tropey story really good by writing a character that's not really flat and terrible. Her motivation for what she does is explored really early on with her relationship to the other orphans and her own complex about being a kid without parents. She set herself up in this savior role by reopening the orphanage and her desperation to find and save Simone is an extension of that. Her own insecurities about being a mother show themselves pretty early on too and we feel it even more when she's dragging herself for what happened with her son because it's confirmation that she may really not be able to handle this. It reminds it reminded me a lot of the mother and son relationship that we eventually got years later in The Babadook. Or I guess The Babadook reminded me of The Orphanage. This movie was directed by J.A. Bayona and his career has been really weird since then. He's done a bunch of movies including Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. He also directed a couple episodes of the new Lord of the Rings series which is part of why I'm actually really excited about that series. That and any new Lord of the Rings content is good content. Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. I said Lord of the Rings, not The Hobbit. Bayona wanted The Orphanage to feel like a 1970s Spanish cinema film, and so it functions really nicely to give a window into filmmaking that is outside the Hollywood style, which is a style that a lot of us might be pretty dead to at this point. Guillermo del Toro's part in the production was really neat, because he and Bayona were good friends. His involvement allowed for a huge budget and a longer filming time. When the film premiered at Cannes, Cannes, Cannes? You know, I don't think I've ever actually heard that spoken out loud or tried to say it out loud myself. Uh, so when the film premiered there, it got a standing ovation that lasted over 10 minutes. 
New Line Cinema bought the rights to make an American remake of the film that would also have Del Toro heavily involved in the production. It was apparently going to be closer to Del Toro's original vision for the script, but after years of the script passing from person to person and even casting rumors about Amy Adams as Laura, the film just kind of fizzled and died. In an interview this year, Larry Fassenden, who was originally helming the project, gave some details on how it was going to be different from the original. He talks about the unique perspective that Del Toro brought to the script because, as any of my fellow Guillermo Del Toro stands will know, Del Toro's father was kidnapped when he lived in Mexico, and he wound up having to negotiate his release, which is one of the reasons that he usually cites for why he moved to the United States from Mexico. His experiences with family members disappearing and the way people around you react to you and to what happened were going to be a lot more present in the remake of the film. The intended remake seems to be a casualty of Hollywood's desire for blockbusters. Part of me is disappointed because I want to see this story again for the first time, but a bigger part of me is sort of relieved that they didn't do a remake like way back then when they were first trying to. I'm sure it would have been great with all of the people who were involved at one point or other, but I don't necessarily think that every good movie needs a remake, especially not one so close to when the original came out. I would be interested in seeing one now because there's more time since the original release. If one was made now, it might bring in new fans and also give us old ones something new to chew on. I will link the interview with Fassenden from Bloody Disgusting in the description. It's a really good read and it made me a lot more comfy with the idea of remaking this property if anybody ever decides to pick up the script again. Moral of the story, if you're looking for a good horror movie to watch this season, check out The Orphanage. If you've already seen it, go watch it again. It's better on the rewatch. And if you do watch it, let me know what you thought about it. It ranks pretty highly in my list of favorite horror movies and I really get a kick out of seeing people experience it for the first time. Now, this is normally the part of the video where I would like play my little outro song and do my little, you know, ah, don't forget to like and comment and subscribe and all that stuff. But I wanted to do something different today because I've had a really bad couple of months. Um, pretty terrible, a lot of lot of stuff going on uh personally professionally just been real sad the last couple of weeks have been pretty terrible a lot of like laying in bed crying listening to music and that kind of thing so my outro song is a version of caroline polachek polachek i don't know how to say her name i don't know if i'm saying that right um but her uh so hot you're hurting my feelings and it was made by someone I'm friends with in a Discord server. And when they initially posted it ages ago, I listened to it and just fell in love with that version of it. It just made me so happy to listen to and I wanted to listen to it all the time. So I asked them if I could start using it as an outro in my videos and they said yes. So that is why I use that song, but also it has almost replaced my listening to the original song because something about it just makes me happy to listen to. I think it's because it was made by somebody that I really enjoy talking to. So when I'm feeling down or sad, I listen to that version of it specifically. I'll still sing along to it and stuff like that because I know the original song so well. And so I thought that instead of my normal outro today, I'm going to play that outro song and do what I normally do when I listen to it, which is various chores and stuff around my house that I've been avoiding doing because I'm sad. So I will be folding my laundry today and putting the credits over that outro song. Mm -hmm. 